Friends, thank you for having me today and thank you to Murray Grove and DM and Carol for the, the honor of sharing during this special anniversary of American Universalism. Now we recorded this back in May, so please forgive anything that seems out of step with whatever is happening in the world in June and whatever is happening in the current news cycle. I know that back here in the past, the, the future looks very uncertain and unknowable and uh, things change very quickly from day to day. So I hope that your world feels safer and healthier and more wise than it does today. Regardless, it's hard to imagine a moment in time that is calling out more for a, a wonderful vision of universalism than now. I realized this in a visceral way several months ago. It was at the beginning of the pandemic when here in New York City, we were getting hammered. Our congregation, the Fourth Universalist Society, is located in the heart of Manhattan and was one of the first to be forced to close its doors and move online. As a minister, I retreated to the comfort of the parsonage to weather out the storm. But the news that was seeping out across the rest of the city was disturbing. I kept hearing from doctors in the congregation that it was worse than anything we were seeing on the news. I kept on hearing news of packed ICUs where whole hospital wings were being converted to take care of the sick. I heard of mass shortages for medical staff and decisions being made about who gets ventilators, not based on who needs them, but on who is most likely to survive. News of family members being barred from seeing their loved ones. And those refrigerator trucks called in to store the bodies that could no longer fit in the morgue. Hearing all of this from the safety of our home, my wife and I hunkered down. If we stayed inside, we thought we would be okay. And then one day, my wife's doctor told her that we needed to go to the ER. It wasn't related to the virus, but the ER was the last place we wanted to go. It was the epicenter of the epicenter. It was where all the disease and sickness was concentrated. It was a place doctors were sending anyone who thought they might be sick, who might have the virus. And even getting there was intimidating. Living in New York City, we didn't have a car. It was 34 degrees and pouring that day. And the ER was 45 blocks away. Traveling anywhere in New York City beyond walking distance meant risk, risking exposure. Do you take the subway? Were there reports of packed trains because they cut services or the bus? Or, or do you take a cab and hope that your driver isn't sick or that a former passenger wasn't. We hedged our bets and we took a cab. We tried not to touch anything and we opened the windows and had our heads breathing out the air. At the ER, when we arrived, we hoped for the best. We were greeted by a security guard whose role seemed to be less of a comforting welcome than as an intimidating bouncer. The room was run down and it felt like the DMV version of an emergency room. It hardly inspired confidence. Now I waited for roughly four hours in that room while my wife went off to get a simple shot. I wasn't allowed to go with her and I watched people come in and out of that room, some very sick, some coughing, some sitting very close to me. Only in the last hour did anyone clean anything. And when they did, they assured me as they asked me to get up to wash my seat that they cleaned it every 30 minutes so I didn't have to worry. I had no masks, no gloves, and neither did many people in that room. The hospital said they didn't have enough to share. The whole experience for me was pretty terrible. It was freezing in there and I felt exposed. I felt unsafe and dirty, like everything I touched was contaminated with the virus and I felt contaminated too. And I wasn't even sick. My wife, I learned, fared worse. Her experience was 
of getting repeatedly ignored and forgotten about and not listened to, of being left to wait in various rooms, not knowing or being told what was happening next. We left that day feeling frustrated and unsettled. The whole thing felt dehumanizing. I was sure that I was going to get the virus. Every little tickle in the back of my throat for the next week caused a spike of anxiety. Could this be it? Could this be the sign that I was sick? Now in that moment, the fear was real and well-grounded given just how fast the virus was spreading. But I also felt anger beyond the fear. Anger at how poorly the ER seemed to be run. By how confusing it had been. How rude the security guard was to people who came in scared and seeking treatment and who were sick. Many of whom didn't even speak English very well. and couldn't understand their yelling about my wife's poor treatment. When I think of our universalist faith, this visit to the ER was a moment of clarity and recognition. If we, my wife and I, had it hard, if it was a terrible experience for us, universalism forced me to imagine how it must have felt to others. Here were we, young white people seeking out care. Here were we with good health insurance from the UUA whose fear of infection wasn't paired with a fear of unpayable medical bills. Here were we who were citizens and spoke the language of the guards and the medical staff and were used to feeling comfortable advocating for ourselves. Our experience with the health system was unusually bad for us. But for many people, that is their norm. After all, it's not like our healthcare system worked great before the pandemic. It's not like medical care was just there for people who needed it or was designed for the good of people from the ground up with intentionality rather than for the corporate profits that run our system. The reason why our, this pandemic is considered a crisis is because now enough people of privilege are worried about their health who aren't used to worrying about it because it's not like the system wasn't in crisis before. We shouldn't be surprised by any of this if we've been paying attention. It's a reality being lived out in the devastating rates of COVID-19 deaths in low-income areas across the country when community of colors are suffering at far greater rates. It's a lie to say that we are all in this together. We never have been and we are not now. The virus itself might not discriminate, but the society we've constructed certainly does. So today, as we come together to honor the 250th anniversary of the beginning of American universalism, I can think of no better moment to reflect on what the future of our faith needs, what it needs to become. We need a universalism that can speak to the issues of our time, to the health disasters that has become this pandemic to the vast inequalities in our world, to the ravages of white supremacy, to the impending disaster of climate change. We need to move from a historic focus on individual salvation to what I believe we need to embrace today, a vision of collective liberation. How do we use these past 250 years of history, of legacy, and use them to move us forward. Now, universalist history is a story of changing focus, of moving our focus from heaven to this world, from God to humanity. It's a story of expanded circles of care, of extended sympathy, of increasingly explicit commitments to human dignity. It's a story of justice and love lived out through human beings learning with each generation after generation. Our story, of course, starts 250 years ago when John Murray first arrived on the shores of America. He brought a vision of universalism that in his day was radical and life-changing for those who heard it. 
Murray is well known, of course, for rejecting the hellfire and brimstone teachings of his day that portrayed God as a punisher and a judge and an executioner. He preached the good news of a softer and kinder and more gentle God who loved their creation above all else, proclaiming it for everyone, no matter who or what they've done. It's a bit hard for us these days to imagine just how comforting and revolutionary this must have felt to hear those words coming from John Murray, to hear that God loved you so much and that you would know God personally in the afterlife instead of this fear of hell and eternal torment. Universalism must have felt like a strong theological hug from God themselves, assuring you that no matter what your life was, everything was going to be okay. It is likely that Murray's theology was influenced by his own deep suffering. We often gloss over his time in Europe before he came to the United States. But while he was there in England and Ireland, Murray suffered deeply. He had fallen in love with his first wife and then lost her and lost his young son and then also lost his three, three sisters and a brother all in a very short time. He found himself so poor that he was incarcerated, thrown into debtor's prison. Murray was someone who, like so many of us today, faced disease and death and poverty in a punitive criminal justice system. He had lost people and seen suffering and suffered himself. On a very human and personal level, we can imagine Murray needing to believe in a God that would never want his loved ones to suffer, never want them to suffer in hell, want them to find God in, their, in the end. Still, Murray's vision of universalism was really different from ours. According to scholar George Hudson Williams, for Murray, the purpose of preaching universalism was to inform humankind of the good news of what was already a fact, that they had already been redeemed. The Universalist Church was then just simply those who had become gradually aware of this revolutionary implication. It was something that they knew and understood. Now this emphasis would continue with Hosea Ballou, the great next leader of Universalism. According to scholar Charles Howe, in Ballou's mind, the goal of Universalism wasn't that different. It was to bring people to a correct understanding of God. The version of universalism, this version, surprised me when I read it because it sounds heady and theological, which is very contrary to how we often talk about universalism, which is as a religion of the heart. But what early universalists were trying to do was change people's minds about who God was. They were trying to affect the heart and reassure it, but to do that, they felt the mind itself needed to understand a new truth. Now, these early universalists were criticized for caring so much about salvation in the afterlife that they ignored the suffering of those in front of them. This criticism, I don't think, is unfair. But it wasn't that Murray and Ballou and others didn't care. Part of it was their orientation. Early universalists stressed that we were all saved by God's benevolence not our actions. The focus of that universalist camera, unlike in universalism at the time, was not on self-improvement as a way to godliness or salvation. The focus was on God and God's forgiveness and God's love of us, not on our behavior, which to universalists was not especially praiseworthy. God was the star of the show because God was saving us. Humans were just the fortunate recipients. Still, though, early universalists had begun to think about society at large and its problems and the injustices of the world. They were notoriously egalitarian and resisted social hierarchies. Mark Harris describes Ballou as having a classless vision without pedigree or genealogies. And Ballou himself wrote that the main object in all we do is happiness knowing that our own happiness is connected with the happiness of our fellow men 
or humans as we would say today, which induces us to be more just and deal mercifully with all. Despite these nice sentiments, Ballou's more lukewarm vision of social justice would still be familiar with many of us today. He was interested in it in theory, but uncomfortable with it in practice. We know it is one thing to speak against injustice and another thing to mobilize against it. It is one thing to have an opinion and another thing to risk our status and our comfort. John Buren writes, speaking of one of Ballou's contemporaries and rivals, Paul Dean, that while disturbed by issues like slavery and war and capital punishment, Dean believed, like Ballou, that each individual should determine the biblical views of such matters, neither involving the church nor disturbing the state. This sentiment hardly screams prophetic. It draws a clear distinction and boundary between religion and the world, suggesting that, that morality and religion can be separate from politics and the world. Now today, most of us, many of us would rightly see this as an abdication of religious responsibility, a convenient way to avoid speaking truth to power and upsetting the status quo and being uncomfortable. Certainly, it was a theology that reinforced social hierarchies and whiteness, racial hierarchies. Few black and brown people in America would have been able to embrace such a separation. The idea of separating faith from their lived experience of slavery or colonization must have sounded absurd and insulting. It should not be surprising then that universalism was largely white for most of its history. It was just too optimistic, too heaven-focused, too centered on God as merciful rather than just. But there were signs that things were changing. The thing about questioning doctrine and bringing a critical mind to religion is that it's a bit like a, a snowball rolling down a hill. It picks up momentum. And it wasn't long before universalists were making new theological connections, taking the theology of a loving God to its next logical conclusion. And it was simply this, that if God is loving and kind and benevolent, if God loves people unconditionally, then maybe people should do that too. I think that Ballou and Dean would have agreed with that sentiment, but it would be the next generation that really started exploring what that meant practically. People started to ask, what, is that, what does it look like to live as generously and full of love as God does? Perhaps the easiest leap for universalists now in the mid 1800s was to look at the systems of criminal justice and capital punishment. If you believed that God loved everyone and was merciful and that God should be an example to you, then it made sense that you would see our criminal justice system back then and now based on punitiveness and revenge is as in conflict with the kind of world that God wanted, the kind of reconciliation and mercy that God offered to people in heaven. Universalists began to look at the world and notice there was a lot of work to do, that God treated people a heck of a lot better than people treated people. Now, I want to be careful here because I think that many of us Unitarian Universalists, and, and I include myself in this category, have a misguided tendency. We rightly take pride in early reformers who pushed universalism and our country to become more just and more kind and open-hearted and open-minded. But just because we can, we can point to a, a few powerful reformers, people like Olympia Brown, who became the first denominationally ordained woman in America, or someone like Horace Greeley, who supported Brook Farm, the radical socialist utopian community. Or we welcome Joseph Jordan in 1889 as the first black universalist minister. It doesn't mean that a majority of universalists were on board with radical social change or were radically open-minded. The fact that I couldn't find a photo of Joseph Jordan anywhere shows that universalists at the time did not prioritize that kind of radical inclusivity 
that we consider so vital. John Buren writes about this as saying that most universalists were neither reactionary nor radical. So we tell a dishonest history if we pretend that our faith was full of only people who history today judges kindly. It's just not true. I only have to look at my own church to be reminded of this. In its heyday, it was called the Cathedral of Universalism. Here is a photo of what it looked like back then. It's not the current church, and it had a great preacher, a man named Edwin Hubble Chapin. Chapin regularly attracted crowds of more than 2,000 people every Sunday. In his pew sat some of the New York City elite, from P.T. Barnum to Horace Greeley and at times the Carnegie family. When Chapin preached at the 100th anniversary of John Murray's arrival in America, the crowd that came to hear him was over 7,000 people. He was a big deal in universalism. And yet, Chapin was not a radical. His theology was one of Christian paternalism, which in universalism at the time was seen as a good thing. God was like a loving father, which the reasoning went was a, a lot better than an abusive one found in other churches. His church, and what would become my church, was even literally called the Church of the Divine Paternity. His was a classic broad church theology. He once said it was better to make men Christians than to make men universalists. Now, this kind of Christian unity can be admirable. Religious unity, interfaith unity can be admirable in many contexts but it also implies a contentment with the status quo. Who cares how American Christianity was expressed, how toxic it might be, how steeped in white supremacy it might be, so long as there was unity in the faith. It's tough to champion unity and also be radical because by having strong beliefs in what is right and wrong, you risk alienating people who disagree with you. And there were a lot of people who disagreed with the radical inclinations of universalism. This isn't to say that Chapin wasn't involved or caring. He spoke out against poverty and societal ills. He established and maintained social service agencies, as did many of his peers. But his vision of God's love was more about charity than justice. Chapin condemned slavery, but for all his followers, and his crowds, and his power. He did very little to stop it. Soon, though, a theological shift began across America which, with the rise of the social gospel movement, and that was what started to bring us closer to the universalism that we know today. It was the work of the great universalist Clarence Skinner, who was one of the first to explicitly tie the core of universalism to social change. It was a big step. In his words, the key to this understanding was this, establishing human misery as a direct consequence of human action. Someone, a man must not only work out his own salvation, but must work out the salvation of the world. Here we see the connection being made that God's love should, not, should also be our love. Focus not just on our salvation, but on one another's. Not just on the next world, but this one. The universalist camera up there in the world shifted from heaven down to earth, and in doing so, it forced universalists to pay attention to the suffering all around them, and that they had the power to do something about it. This was so different from 100 years ago, when universalism was focused on heaven and individual salvation. Here we were seeing the beginning of a universalism encompassing a new moral imperative, and of course, there were limitations. The male language and Skinner's words are an obvious example that universalism did not yet reflect or understand the importance of universality of the human experience, understand the importance of language and the power of symbolism. The same applied to race, where little to no relationships existed be between universalism and, the, and communities of color, nor any language or awareness or willingness to dismantle 
and address its almost exclusive whiteness. There were a few examples of concrete progress, noticeably through the establishment of mission schools to black communities in the South. They were led by leaders like Joseph F. Jordan and Annie Bazell Jordan Willis, among the first black universalist clergy who served and led the Suffolk Normal Training School in Virginia. Early examples of universalists embracing a wider vision for what a historically white denomination could be. Unfortunately, though, this openness was largely confined to small pockets and notable leaders. These early, early black universalist leaders struggled to find a larger role beyond the confinedness of these schools. But still, the path to the present was set. It was nowhere near good enough. Humanism burst on the scene whose impact would lead many universalists to move away from Christianity and dream of a new world religion that was finally truly universal. Here was the belief that not only was everyone good and worthy of love and loved by God, but they could actually be in the same religion together. Universalism could be a place for all religion, not just a place that said everyone was saved. Theologically, the original concern championed by John Murray of universal salvation has receded to be replaced by a moral imperative of simply recognizing that all people deserve love and a life of dignity and fairness. Today, we have even abandoned the belief of one universal religion, which was at the time led conveniently by universalists. We see that as naive and paternalistic and colonialist. But the hope of this religion of the world finds life in our commitment today to welcome everyone, no matter who they are, or what they believe. Now this radical welcome can be a powerful thing. It pushes us to minister to the lost and the lonely and the seeker. It pushes us to be more welcoming of those from marginalized identity groups and look inwards at why only certain people feel comfortable being in universalist pews. By light with Chapin's broad church, this modern interpretation of what universalism means a.k.a. universalist welcome, can also be problematic. It can prevent us from being, being anything in particular or truly, truly taking stances that matter if we try to be all things to all people. I think in recognizing these problems and dissecting them, we can begin to find a path forward to a kind of universalism that the world actually needs right now in this world of the pandemic, of climate change, and inequality, and racism. At Fourth Universalist, where I serve, we wrestle with this challenge and the tension of radical welcome constantly. To start, I should make a caveat that our congregation is a bit unusual in several relevant ways. One, the average age of our congregation is, is incredibly young, young enough that someone like me, who is 35 years old, sometimes feels old. I've had people have to go off to meetings because they have plans to go clubbing. But really, this youthfulness is just a sign that we are generationally balanced. The youthfulness keeps us honest and engaged with the issues of our time. And the elders in our congregation offer us the wisdom and perspective that comes with their age. Being in New York City, we also have greater racial and economic diversity than many other UU congregations we've served. And I say this as a proud Midwesterner who grew up rolling my eyes at New Yorkers. New York City finds itself, tends to find itself on the edge of national learning curves and national trends. It's the heart of global culture and media and business. What happens here tends to radiate outwards to the rest of the country which is a fascinating place to be, and it keeps me and our congregation on its toes. All of this unusualness for us as a Unitarian Universalist congregation has forced us and led us to reformulating this idea of what universalism is. There is a growing sense in our congregation that being a member at Fourth Universalist 
means being someone who cares about justice. And not just cares, but does something about it. The image of religious community and justice work are interwoven to the point of being the same. It would be very hard, I believe, to be a member at this congregation without embracing the work of systematic social change. Now, this has been unintentional, but in a congregation that has been fractured and dysfunctional for close to 100 years, this unity of purpose has brought a sense of togetherness, an ability to move swiftly and together to meet challenges of our time, to move from a place of health. This was evident as early as 2017, following the election, when I received a call from a community organizer. It was shortly after this election, and they shared with me just how much fear and uncertainty there was in the immigrant communities that they were organizing with. They asked us as a congregation if we would consider being a sanctuary, a place to protect undocumented immigrants fearing deportation. Now, I had never been in these waters before. It was an uncertain time. It was a scary time for everyone. So I told the board that day, and two days later, they decided to put the question to the congregation. Should we be a congregation that welcomes immigrants who are undocumented into our space? And the conversation there was stunning to me. There was no debate about whether it was the right thing to do even though it was legally questionable. There was no foot dragging or grumbling about being too political. There was no committees formed to bat the idea back and make extensive plans to make sure that we were all perfect and ready for whenever that happened. There were no surveys taken beforehand to see what people thought. The congregation understood itself as being presented with a simple choice, that when community allies ask you to show up and do something, especially on behalf of vulnerable people, you do it. With less than two days notice, the congregation voted unanimously. I was shocked, but I was also really proud. This was evident again when a year later, the congregation actually took a family into sanctuary, a mother and her two children. The mother had fled gang violence in Guatemala. She had suffered at the hands of U.S. border agents and been assaulted sexually while in detention and only wanted to stay in the country, in this country, because she loved it. She believed in America. She wanted to be with her children and be safe from fear. The congregation embraced them and her family as their own, loving them so dearly that they even became members. It hasn't always been easy we found swastikas carved on our beautiful front door shortly after becoming a sanctuary church. We've had White Lives Matter nonsense spray paid over our stately limestone building. But instead of recoiling or changing course or sinking into fear, the congregation has consistently doubled down and it has brought people together. The community around us has come together to hold us in love and solidarity. After the swastikas, we welcomed over 500 people to our sanctuary to condemn, condemn hate. Congressman Jerry Nadler spoke. Journalist Bill Moyer spoke. It was powerful. We felt held. Our congregation's commitment to justice unequivocally has not only brought unity, but also growth. Learning to be unapologetic and uncompromising has led to increased diversity and institutional health. And the reason why this is all possible is that we have embraced a new version of universalism, a kind of universalism that is no longer concerned about universal welcome, a kind of universalism that doesn't care about making people feel comfortable or cozy or sheltered in their beliefs. It's a universalism that instead is about collective liberation. Universalism and collectivism are two words that have a lot in common. They suggest solidarity and togetherness of purpose. They suggest action rather than passive reception. They do not pretend that we are the same or should be the same or should all be universalists together and that makes us feel good or that we can be all things to all people. Most importantly, 
universal liberation would not sacrifice justice for false unity or fear of hurt feelings. It uses justice to build real unity, which means showing up for people who really are in need. Now I know out there that there are many people who are wary of social justice becoming a Unitarian Universalist creed. I get that. I do. We don't like creeds, and frankly, if we had one, I probably would be left out. But centering social justice is no more creedal than centering our seven principles. If you read them, it's so clear that social justice is in them. Every single one. It's undeniable. If social justice feels creedal to you, then the principles should feel creedal to you. And then we have a bigger problem because those have been around for a long time and we use them everywhere. But even if it wasn't in the principles, the world is too full of suffering, too full of hurt and pain and inequality and injustice for us as moral people to not make it the center of what we do. We can be all spiritual and deep and profound but if we know that there are kids trapped in cages and are dying and we do nothing, we are nothing short of complicit. If we praise ourselves as scholars or theologians or being above the political fray, but we know that black and brown Americans are being killed on the streets in terrifying rates and we do nothing, we are heartless. If people can't get health care for their families, that's life and death for them. It's not politics. The universalism of the future doesn't make excuses for inaction or uncaring. It doesn't say, well, it's okay if justice isn't your thing. It doesn't say, well, it's okay if you think certain policies are the same or that the role of the church is about spiritual per personal spirituality or that neutrality means that you aren't choosing a side and that moderation is a virtue. The universalism of the future is universalist not because everyone is just under the same roof and feeling cozy and comfortable together, or that the circle is drawn wide enough to bring everybody in. Its universality comes from its universal care. It fights for everyone. It's concerned for everyone. It cares about everyone. Not about their cozy feelings of feeling okay and unpolitical. This new universalism refuses to center those who have always been in the center, catering to that. It's universalist because it less, is less about us and our congregations and more about who we serve and care for. Should we want everyone who comes into our UU congregations to feel good and welcome in a true and deep and profound way? Of course, we are a place that offers sanctuary and love. That is, that is something that should never go away. And it should, it should continue to be our work and our challenge to make that especially true for those who have been historically shut out, for those for whom our cultures of white supremacy have made our congregations unsafe and unwelcoming. We need to work on that and keep working on that. Would we welcome those who are sincere and, and in need of spiritual community and are still learning their path? Of course. But should we be willing to say loudly and boldly that universalism means fighting for collective liberation and the liberation of everyone? Yes, absolutely. Will we lose some people? Yes. But what I've seen at Fourth Universalist is that we will gain plenty more. Plenty who appreciate the clarity of mission. Plenty who have been yearning for a religion to say what it means and does what it says. Plenty who are tired of the banality and religious piffle and are longing for real work to do, real change to contribute and offer and to make the world a better place. Real allies in the fight. Now I know this is a paradigm shift. It views justice not as a moral choice, not as just one many ways that we can experience our spirituality, but it views it as a moral necessity. It's not about your opinion or about a choice, but about fundamental human decency.
decency. If we are too afraid to make this clear and draw a line in our universalist sand, in today's world, we will lose our soul and forfeit our integrity and slip into irrelevance. What will this new universalism look like? What principles will ground in? There are a few principles that we need to, I think, return to again and again to remind us of what this world needs to look like and what this new universalism, this universal liberation looks like. We need to assume that there is more suffering and pain out there than we know and can understand, especially those of us with privilege. We need to center and learn from the voices and experiences of those on the margins always, because the stories that most of us hear, the stories, the histories most of us are told, the news that most of us experience excludes and minimizes those who are suffering the most. We need to understand that power reinforces power and that those with the power are more often working for their own selfish interests than not. It's true for corporations, it's true for the wealthy, it's true for those who are in government. To assume otherwise is naive and dangerous, dangerous and ignorant of history. We need to internalize that white supremacy continues to harm countless lives each and every day, not just nationally, but in our own congregations, cities, and towns. We need to recognize that our system of economics, which rewards consumerism and personal greed and the commodification of human labor and the earth's bounty, is by its very nature exploitative, oppressive, and spiritually compromised. We need to learn that we set a very low bar for goodness if it is simply about being nice or caring for those we know or identify with. We need to raise the bar so that goodness means justice. It means understanding that human suffering is not just a personal thing, but a systematic thing. We need to know that status quo for millions of Americans means living in crisis, fear, and pain, and that the status quo itself is not okay or morally acceptable. A moderate path is not the path of universalism. That if the normal times do not feel like a crisis to you, it's because you have enough privilege to be sheltered from it. And finally, we need to recognize that nothing will get better unless something drastic changes in our society. Systems and structures must change. The old ways will not work and do not work. Whatever being a good universalist means in the future, it means learning to know and experience the world differently than we've done before. It requires great humility on the part of us with privilege. It requires learning and intentionally seeking out what we do not know, the stories that are not being told, the voices we are not hearing. It requires knowing when to cede space to others as an ally and when to take up more space because our privilege protects us. It's not enough just to give to your church or show up on Sunday or to read the Bible or to think deeply. It's not just enough for your pastor to preach a good sermon on something. It's not good enough just to pay your taxes or vote or post on Facebook your outrage. We need, and the universalism of the future needs to care enough to do something about it, to see justice as a spiritual practice, to take risks. Ministers need to be community organizers. Congregations need to be hubs of community activism. For all the 250 years of American universalism, we have seen our faith struggle with what love means. We've seen the power of knowing that God loves us, about the imperative that we should love just as deeply, about how that love includes everyone and everything on this planet, no matter what. But now universalism today must go deeper into a world where we understand that love is not simply a feeling, not simply the, the act of welcoming people into our space, but as a motivator for universal liberation and radical social change. I don't want anyone to have the experience that we had in the ER that day. 
I don't want anyone to feel dehumanized or feel like they live in a society that doesn't care about them. And I don't want anyone to see a faith that calls itself universalist, pretending simply that it's universalist because we say over and over again that all are welcome in our buildings. There is far too much suffering in this world to play it that safe. The universalism of the future needs to teach us that unless we are challenging the status quo, unless we know that the status quo is a crisis, we are failing the legacy we've inherited. We are failing our fellow human beings. This is not a moment to be above the fray, to worry about offending people who prefer moderation to real action. We can't care about feeling cozy. We can't sacrifice justice on behalf of those not yet ready or willing to join the fight. We must move beyond the goal of universal welcome in its shallowest form and move towards the goal of universal liberation. We have to believe that this is true to our faith's history. We have to believe it is right for our moment now. And I pray now and I will keep praying that it will lead us forward to a better future. May it be so. Thank you and amen.